Amusement Arcade Show with Jerry Stellenberg, who's going to tell us about uh, the developments of Multimorphic, one of the new breed of boutique pinball manufacturers. It's got a fabulous game. Um, we're going to learn all about the new technology and progress to date. Okay, over to you, Jerry. Thank you, Gary. So, yes, my name is Jerry Stellenberg with Multimorphic. Multimorphic is a, as Gary suggested, a, a new pinball manufacturer. We started out designing boards, we're getting into machines, we'll talk all about that. Right now we're a, a very small company. We have just a couple full-time people, a bunch of part-time people, but we have very big goals. We, we're trying to bring new technology, new ideas, new, uh, new games, new interactions, new things to pinball. Because pinball's been the same for a long time. Jerry, would you mind just moving up on the, the table and you could in the light so our online audience can see you? Can you see me here? Is this better? Could you go up the stairs just behind the table? Oh, you want me to talk up here? If you can. Okay. It would be much appreciated. Okay. Thank you. I was going to stand in front of the screen, but this is fine. So, the big, our big goal is to make pinball relevant to consumers today. And I believe pinball isn't really relevant to people anymore. And it's not very common, it's not very popular. Why is that? Because consumer, consumer behavior has changed. Roger Sharp, I'm sorry, Josh Sharp actually was quoted recently as saying, people used to eat dinner at home and go out for entertainment. You know, you'd eat dinner in the house and you'd go to, a, you'd go to the arcade, you'd go to the bowling alley, the movie theater, whatever. That's changed. Now it's almost the exact opposite. Now we go out for dinner and we come home for entertainment. People have their, their home theater rooms in their house. They have you know, their game consoles. They have all this technology at their home. They don't need to go out for, for their entertainment anymore. And pinball traditionally has been this location-based industry. Machines and arcades. To play a pinball machine, you have to leave the house. Well, now that's changing. People are starting to buy pinball machines for their homes, but traditional style pinball machines just aren't designed they're not well suited for consumer consumption, for putting in your home. And why is that? Well, let's walk through a simple example. If you saw my show at Texas, this is a very sim simple example, but it's worth walking through again just because I think you all can probably relate to it. So, so you stop going to the arcade, you buy a machine, you put it in your house, you, you stick it in your living room, you play it for two or three months, and then I guarantee everyone in the room knows what happens next. You, you get bored of it in a few months and Honey, wouldn't it be cool if we put a couple more games in our house? So you stick a couple more games in the game room, you got your pool table, you got your pinball machines, you play those for a year. What happens, Kim? Buy more you buy more games. So in the next picture, the pool table's now gone, the room's full of pinball machines. Do we stop there? Oh, no. no, we don't stop there. So I'll just jump through these slides real quick. You know, pretty soon the whole house is full of pinball machines. I mean, the example is silly, but it, it, it's real, and it shows off some of the problems we have with traditional style machines, um, and the big one being footprint. You buy a machine, you stick it in your house, you allocate, what, a two foot by four foot area, you play that machine, you buy another one, you need another two foot by four foot area, you buy a few more machines, now you're moving couches, you're moving pool tables, you, you're... You're taking your kid's room, you're putting your kids in bunk beds, letting you take the other room. You're just, you're making sacrifices in your life for these games. So footprint's a big problem. They're antiquated technology. I mean, most of the games even being manufactured or, or being discussed about being manufactured today are functionally very similar to the way they were 20, 30 years ago. A lot of games still have dot matrix displays. They still have the same kind of technology on the play fields, physical the same physical kind of targets and pop bumpers and interactions. It's still a, piece of paint, a painted piece of wood with light inserts and a few mechanical toys. And yes, that's what we all like about pinball. We like the mechanical interactions, but it'd be neat. It would be able to compete better with consumer technology if we could introduce new kinds of functions, new features, new interactions, new things, just new ideas. How do we bring new ideas to pinball? Well, we'll talk about that, but one of the problems with traditional games is and when I say traditional, I mean traditional style games, even like I said, the new machines coming out are still to me traditional style games. They can't compete very well with the traditional consumer technology, like your game consoles, like your, your mobile electronic devices. 
You have, a, you have a, a computer sitting on your table and you have a pinball machine next to it. One of them screams high-tech current technology, the other screams old-school technology. And it's just, just kind of the perception. Another issue with pinball machines is maintenance, of course. They're physical devices. They break. They're hard to debug. They're expensive to debug. Most people who buy things for their homes don't want to maintain them. Right? You buy a computer, you expect it to work. You buy a video game console, you expect it to work. You buy a, I don't know, a, a, a mobile phone, you expect it to work. You buy a pinball machine, well, you should want to expect it to work. But we all know pinball machines with this, this heavy steel ball flying around a wooden play field hitting mechanical things, they just break and we have to deal with that. Average consumers don't know how to deal with that. They don't know how to debug electronic problems. They don't know how or don't want to fix mechanical problems. Cleaning the machines is an effort. I mean, it takes it takes a good hour, two hours, three hours to disassemble enough of the play field to clean it. And most of us as collectors, we're, 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 so some of us like doing that, but it, if we have five, six, seven machines, then just to clean them takes, I mean, it, it's, it's a process. And the last big point is cost per game. Pinball machines are expensive. New pinball machines cost anywhere from what, 5,000 to 10,000 and up? I think, I, think, I think there are manufacturers today offering machines for that whole range, for, from the low end 5K up to 10K, and, and a couple boutique designers even offering games for 13K or 17K for, for a lot of money. So pinball machines are expensive. Compare that to video game consoles. And you'll notice the, the red bars which represent pinball machines, I cut them off at 1,000. But like I just said, they're really somewhere between five and $10,000. I cut them down just so you'd be able to see the other lines on the chart. The blue lines represent a video game console. So with a video game console, you pay four or five hundred dollars, you get a console, and you never have to buy another big electronic box that, that runs your games. Now you just add games to it. So you, you buy a couple more games, you see the, the very small blue bars next to uh, everything but, but entry number one. It's thirty, forty, fifty dollars for additional games. You build up this library of games and then you have a lot of games and you haven't spent a lot of money. So how can we do something like that in the pinball industry? And we'll talk about that as well. So our goal, like I said earlier, is to make pinball relevant to today's consumers. And we want to do that two different ways. One, we want to, and we believe we have, and this is how we based our, our business early on, is to design the industry's most advanced control system. If you have a control system, that enables support for features that you simply couldn't do on older style games, then we've given people the ability to build new interactions, new functions into their machines. The second is what we started doing about a year ago, a year and a half ago, is we want to build the most advanced pinball, and I've shown as a platform, we want to build the most advanced pinball platform in the industry. So I just gave you the example of a video game console so you can kind of figure out what I mean by platform here, but we'll talk about that more in a little bit as well. So control system. We started out four years ago designing controller boards for pinball machines. The PROC board, it stands for Pinball Remote Operations Controller. This is a board. Um, you're all welcome to see it after the seminar. Just come up and talk to me. I'll show you all the boards that I'm going to show you here in a minute. So the PROC board, it in, in very layman terms, it connects a pinball machine to a computer. And when I say computer, I mean anything that can control a USB port. So it could be a, a big server computer, it could be a laptop computer, it could be a, a little tiny Raspberry Pi, a $35 computer. A little tiny board that you can stick in your computer or in your pinball machine and it can run the game software and, and talk to the pinball machine. So we started with this board. This board has logic that runs on it that handles all of the real-time control of the pinball machine. And I apologize, the next five or ten minutes of this seminar are pretty low level technical details, but then we'll jump into the exciting stuff and talk about the machine. Well, some of you think this might be the exciting stuff, but, but everybody, like the first three rows of people all said, this is the good stuff. So the, the PROG board has low level technology that runs the logic that interfaces to the machine. And by that what I mean is, y your software doesn't have to turn on a coil wait for some distance or some length of time, then turn off a coil and handle all the interface. It doesn't have to assert switch column rows and then scan each individual switch or turn on columns and look at rows. It doesn't have to do all that individually. 
the PROC can do all that for us. So for example, if we want to pulse a coil for 30 milliseconds, we just send a pulse command to the hardware. The hardware turns on the coil, it sets a delay, 30 milliseconds later it turns off the coil. So that's the pulse function that I've outlined there. There are schedule functions where you can have it do certain patterns of things on your output devices. If you want a lamp show, you can set it up to turn on and off lamps at specific intervals or at some sequence of intervals and do a whole lamp show on your machine without any software interaction. Patter function I've, is short for pitter patter, which is a duty cycle kind of thing. So if you want to assert a coil and have it, have it stay up, you're going to turn on and off power real quickly to it so it, it doesn't drop. We call that patter. Colors, fading for LEDs, for RGB LEDs, which are more popular now than the incandescent lamps that they used to put in pinball machines. We can automatically set colors. We can automatically fade between colors. We can have 100 LEDs on a machine and tell the software to automatically fade each individual LED from one color to another color at different fade rates. The hardware does all that. Software, all, all software needs to do is, is process your game rules. When this switch happens, I want to I start a timer, I want to raise a, a target up, I want to I enable something, I want to show an animation on the screen, or I want to do something. That's all your software needs to do. Our hardware can handle all the low-level details. So we started with the PROC board and we interfaced it to existing driver boards like Williams driver boards and Stern driver boards so that people could drop in a PROC and they could write custom rules for their machines. Or if they're building custom machines, they could drop a PROC in and build their machine around that using some kind of existing driver setup. So that worked for a couple years and then we decided we wanted to, to move forward with the rest of the control system and we designed driver boards. So our driver board this is one example of it. It's two and a half inches by eight inches. And if you compare that to an existing driver board, you're, which is, you know, the old Williams board is pretty big. The, stern, the, the more recent Stern board for the SAM system is a little bit smaller, but it's still a significant size board. And if something breaks on it, you pull the whole board out, send it off for repair, buy a new, new one, a couple hundred dollars, and your game's down while you're doing that. So we designed a board bullet point two, it's modular and it's chainable. So our board, this one particular, drives 16 devices. There are two banks, you can see them on the picture, one at the front, one at the back, two banks of eight transistors. Each bank can be powered individually, each bank is fused individually, each bank has a connection that goes out to a bunch of drivers, whether they're coils or magnets, lamps, whatever, flashers. Each bank can be driven with different power, they're totally independent, we can chain them, and the power they get is DC. So if you're used to these traditional style power driver boards, they all have AC inputs and they have rectifiers to rectify the power to DC so you can use them on your circuits. And a lot of the problems we have with those older power driver boards is those rectifier um, devices go out. So we have to replace rectifiers, we have to replace capacitors that, have, that are 20 years old and are dying. Our board takes DC power. And what that means is you can go to the store and you can buy a new power supply off the shelf for whatever voltage you need to drive. If you need a, a new 24 volt power supply because your, your old one died, you just go to the store and buy it. When you go to eBay, you can buy a 50 volt power supply for $30. Get a DC power supply, stick it in your machine, connect it to your driver boards, and you're good to go. Let's not talk about soon, coming soon yet. Let's talk about the fact that uh, we have... We have 16 drivers on this driver board, the PD-16. We have another driver board that looks the exact same, but it's got a different bank of transistors on one side. We use that for driving an 8x8 LAM matrix. And we have a third board, or we're about to. It's designed, it's tested, we just need to release it. We need to get it through manufacturing to release it. It's a PD-LED board. It's like we said, with RGB LEDs becoming real popular, we need a way to efficiently drive those, to do the automatic fading, to, to allow a machine to have a bunch of LEDs. So we designed a new board to, to handle those specifically. That's actually here too. This one's even smaller. It's just a little two and a half by four inch board that this board can drive 84 individual LEDs or if you divide that by three to get a, a multicolor RGB LED, it's 28 RGB LEDs. So you're probably asking yourself, how do I build a machine or if I want to build a machine and have more than 16 coils, more than an eight by eight lamp matrix, or more than 28 RGB LEDs, what do I do? Our boards only support that much. Well, these boards are, are chainable. So they talk to the PROC directly. 
There's a connection that goes back to the P-Rock, and then there's just two wires that chain from this board to any number of additional boards. So you could put one of these in your machine, or you could put, if you want 64 devices, you could put four of these in your machine. You could put two of these and two of the LED boards and mix and match however you want. You can build a machine to your own specifications, as many features as you want. You, can, you, could, put, you could put 4,000 LEDs on your machine. You could build a virtual DMD with RGB LEDs on your pinball machine if you wanted to. You can, you can really do whatever you want. There's no, there is a limit. There's no practical limit to the number of devices you can have on your machine. So we believe our current control system is the most advanced in the industry. I used to not use superlatives like that. I used to not, not, not put myself out there and say ours is better than anybody else's. But we believe anything you want to do on a pinball machine, you can actually use them for other things other than pinball machines too, but anything you want to do on a pinball machine, you can do with our boards. You have a computer in your system, which with a comp you can choose your computer to be whatever you want running any operating system. You can add devices to your computer through you know, USB or Bluetooth or however you want to connect stuff to your computer if you want to add features that our boards don't specifically support. And then you can add any number of devices to your machine you want using our boards. We believe pretty much anything you can think to do with your, your pinball machine, you can do with our boards and that computer. And I don't think that can be said of any other, de any other developer of pinball technology today. But we're not stopping there. We're, uh, we're developing new products. I mean, we're, we're technology people. That's what we like to do is develop new products. I have a picture there of a, a new set of PCBs. Those PCBs are actually the first bullet, the P3 Rock. So it's a new version of the P-Rock that has new, newer features. And you're probably asking yourself, what, what additional features would somebody want to put on a pinball machine? And I'll leave that to your imagination right now. But when we release the board, we'll, we'll describe all of the uh, additional features that we've put on the, the P-Rock. It's smaller. It doesn't have backwards compatibility with the existing machines. It doesn't have a DMD connection. So this is a board that you might consider buying if you're building a custom machine and connecting it to an LCD display or something and using our, uh, our uh, custom driver boards. You wouldn't use this to retheme an existing machine, but we're actually using this board for our machine, which we'll also talk about later. SW16 is a 16-input si switch board. That's what this is. Traditional pinball machines use a switch matrix. They have, whether it's 64 or 128 switches on their machine, they wire them all in through this cross-connect of wires, that each switch has a diode on it. They're hard to debug. They're, if, a, if a switch goes out because a diode breaks or something, it, finding out the problem is, is usually very difficult. With this board, every single switch on your machine can be direct wired. So you wire up 16 switches to this board, and it works the same as the driver boards. There's a two-wire chain. You can add one of these boards. You can have 16 of these boards. If you want 128 switches on your machine, you can have a... I guess that's eight of these boards, and you just chain them together. So you're wiring. You're going to have a bank of switch targets. You're going to have a bank of, I don't know, pop bumpers or, or whatever you have. You stick this board under your machine. You mount it directly next to the features that it's controlling, and your wiring on is very short. Your debugging is very easy. And if, for some reason, something gets shorted out on your play field and this board dies, no problem. Just throw it away and, and grab another one and stick it in your machine. It's, it's not a uh, $300 CPU board that you're replacing. It's just a little cheap switch input board. And the last product we're, we're currently designing, we're, we're going to release this soon, is a new AC to DC board. So we talked about the fact that we take DC voltage into all of our driver boards. And you can go off the shelf and buy power supplies to do that DC. But if for some reason you want some specific voltage for some specific reason, or you know some cheap supplier of transformers that convert you know, 110 AC to, to whatever it is you need, 70 volts, 50 volts, 30 volts, 16 volts, whatever it is you need, then you can use our board and convert it. Our, our board will work with any AC voltage up to about 100 and create DC for you. So you can create any voltage drill you need. And then there's software. So a set of hardware boards to control a pinball machine are useless unless you write software for them. They don't do anything until you until you talk to them and tell them what to do with software. So we could just release a set of boards and say, here's a low-level driver. Now go off and write all the game code yourself, do everything yourself. Nobody would want to do it. Um, I mean, <laughs> ask Gary Stern, who's sitting in the back. Ask, ask anybody who's, uh, 
designing pinball machines today, um, part of the, the, the longest part of development is probably the, the software development cycle. So the most we can do to help other people develop software for their games means it's going to make them more likely to, to want to use our system. So we have an open source driver. We have an open source software framework that works on top of that driver. You can literally, it's no joke, you can literally install our, install our boards, install the software on your computer. The same day you install that software, you can be running a pinball game. That pinball game may just launch balls, track the balls as they, as they drain, tell you now it's player two's turn, or, or now you're on ball two or ball three. It's, it's an empty skeleton game, but you can literally get that running on day one. You install the tools, there's a, there's a skeleton game that comes with them, you run it, it's a pinball game. Then all you do is fill it in with your rules. Like we talked about earlier, when switch X gets hit, assert these coils, or, or change these lights, or, or start a timer, or do whatever you want. So it comes with the skeleton game, and then we have a bunch of customers who have open sourced their games. I've written a game or two, two games, they're open source, they're freely available, you can download them, you can use them as a basis for your game, you can change them if you like my game. I wrote it, for, ex for example, I wrote a game that runs on Judge Dredd, the Judge Dredd from, uh, I believe it was Bally. You swap in the, the P-Rock with the CPU board, you can run my code, to have a, holy, whole, a totally different playing experience on Judge Dredd. Well, great. You, you download it, you play it, you like most of it, but you don't like 10%, you don't like what happens in this mode or that mode, you can go in and change it. It's freely available code. You can, like I said, you can use it as a basis for your game or you can write your own code or, or, or change up rules that, that you don't like. So who are our customers? I keep saying you can build a game. Who am I talking about? Well, pretty much anybody. People who want to retheme a game, people who want to build a custom machine, other pinball manufacturers. Pretty much every boutique manufacturer that's announced we're going to build pinball machines in the last two years, not every single one, but most of them we've talked to about using our system, and a couple of them have decided to use our system. And again, those people get an advantage. They stick our system in there, and on day one, they can run game software. Then they just have to fill in the rules. So other pinball manufacturers, and then I just threw down there on the, on the bottom of the slide that other electronic hobbyists can use our boards. I mean, they're just really, you have a computer controlling drivers and controlling lamps and controlling switches. So, I mean, robotics or, or some other industry, there, there's lots of things you can do with these boards. You don't necessarily have to be a, a pinball player to a, or a pinball fan to use these boards. So let's stop there for a second and just see if anybody has questions about the control system itself before we talk about the machine. If you do, Kim, yes, please stand up and right behind you there's a microphone. If you would, just for the people online, they'll, they'll hear the question. Um, uh, I have the P-Rock in my Cactus Canyon. I love it. Uh, what Eric did with it is phenomenal. Um, but this new board you're talking about, will that have sound? Are you adding sound to that, or how are you handling that? Okay, so the P-Rock, the old P-Rock, I'll rephrase the question. The old P-Rock was just an interface from the computer to the pinball machine. It controlled the physical stuff, the, the switches, the drivers, and the DMD. It did not have any sound logic on it because you have a computer there so you just you connect a, a wire to your line out you connect speakers and the difficulty with the old P-Rock board is that wiring the computer into your existing cabinet speakers requires a modification of the audio board so Kim's asking if the new board we talked about will have integrated audio processing capabilities and the answer is no we still we have all that functionality on the PC and if we went and designed the sound circuit I mean, some would like it, some wouldn't. Some would want to redesign it. Some would want a different crossover for their base. Some would want it to be a, a, different, a different power capable. Um, we have the PC there. We're just going to rely on the PC. Um, specifically for the, the uses of the P3 Rock, it's not going into retheme. So it's, it wouldn't go into your Cactus Cannon. It wouldn't go into, into a, a Stern machine or a Williams machine. The P3 Rock would probably only be used by people building custom machines. And for people building custom machines, then they're probably already designing their own sound circuits, their own speaker setups around that system anyway. So then just connecting the line into the computer, is, it, it's, it makes sense for them. Anybody else questions on the control system? No. Okay. Okay, low-level stuff over. Let's talk, let's talk pinball machines. So like I said before, we want to create what we believe is the most advanced pinball machine available. It's a picture of our third prototype. Our second prototype had an oak, a, a light-colored oak cabinet. Our first prototype was just 
was just a, uh, a mix, <laughs> mix of different materials on the cabinet. This is our first prototype with a full head. Our control system is mounted underneath the play field on our machine, so there's no functional need for a head. And it, since it's going into people's houses, we're offering the option to not, to not, to buy the machine without a head. Which actually sounds kind of funny, but when you see a pinball machine in your house, that head is what, is what visually takes a lot of room in the house. So you stick a pinball machine without the head on there, and you can see right over it, it, it feels much smaller. So it, it makes a lot of sense in a home not to have a head. Though having a machine without a head in an arcade doesn't really make any sense. It's got to look like a pinball machine, and it's got to have pretty artwork and stuff on it. So let's talk about how this P3, we call it the P3 because it stands for P-Rock Pinball Platform, or P3 Pinball Platform, or the third generation of pinball. People called that, uh, that virtual kind of mixture of uh, that projected image, Pinball 2000, that projected image thing in, in 2000. They called that the second generation of pinball. So we kind of took a play on that and said, we're the third generation, we'll call it the P3. How are we addressing the technology issue that we discussed before? Remember we said old games were traditional games, they can't compete with modern technology because they're the same as they were 20 or 30 years ago. Well, so the, the big obvious thing in our machine, as you can see in the video, is that LCD in the play field. With the LCD, we could create the exact same thing you're used to playing today. We could draw a picture, stick it on the screen. We could draw virtual inserts, you know, extra ball inserts or, or, or arrows that show you what to shoot or whatever. We can draw those things and make them look like a traditional machine, but there's so much more we can do with it. Clearly, we can add instructions to the screen. We can change the backgrounds. We call it dynamic artwork. But it's not just dynamic, because we're tracking the position of the ball anywhere it rolls on the top of the play field. So it's dynamic and it's interactive artwork. We can have the physical pinball interacting with graphics on the screen. I don't think there are any examples of that in this video. No, there aren't. But uh, one of the demo modes we wrote up is an asteroids game, where you have asteroids floating around the screen. The physical pinball, as it rolls over them, will blow them up. So we can do lots of new things. We call them new interactions that we can do because we have this, this screen in there. Another feature we can do because we have this ability to track the ball is we can measure the speed of the ball. We know exactly where it all is at all times, so we know how long it takes to get, for instance, from the flipper to, to uh, the edge of the screen, the edge of the monitor, so we can track the, the speed of the ball. We can have modes, we can have graphics that depend on how fast you flip or force you to do little soft flips. We could have, I don't know, an example like a track and field game where the speed that you flip the ball or, or the, the speed that you collect as you hit loops determines how fast your character is running. Or, or we could have some kind of, of speed measurement before you virtually throw your javelin into the field. Or, I mean, we could just do all kinds of things because we can measure the speed of the ball, which nobody could ever do before. Well, I guess you could through specific shots, but you couldn't do it generally like we're doing. Animated flippers, we call it. Because we have these flippers, which are clear, clear acrylic, which is, which is a plastic. They're not actually acrylic. They're a lot harder, a lot more sturdy than acrylic. Because they're clear, because we have a screen right underneath them, we can make it look like the flippers are different colors. Or now you can see little text. You can't actually read it because the resolution is too low. But there's text on the screen under the flippers. It actually says animated on the left and flippers on the right. We can draw colors. We can, we can physically or virtually animate our flippers, make it look like they're, they're different shapes. Or, or we, could, we can do things like if the ball hits a flipper, because we know where the ball is at all times, the flipper blasts red, like a little explosion occurs when the ball hits the flipper. We can create these virtual effects to enhance the physical experience that, that just simply couldn't be done before. So the footprint problem that we talked about in that example where you, <laughs> you fill your house up with pinball machines, we're trying to address that. The video game example I gave you where you buy one console and fill it up with games, that's the model we're, we're trying to mimic. So our entire upper play field, the section above those, uh, they're hard to see, but there's a, a few raised up things in the middle. There's walls and there's scoops that come up and down in the middle of the screen or right after the LCD. The entire section of the machine behind that line of features is a module. You can literally lift that module up 
stick it aside, take a different module and stick it down and play a totally different game. You can have themed modules with different toys, with different artwork, with different shot layouts, some with pop bumpers, some without pop bumpers, different target, target uh, configurations. You know, just like you go to the, the arcade, you see however many machines you see and they're all different. Our machine can be physically all different too. So yes, of course, we have that monitor and we have that row of walls and scoops in there and those are fixed, that's part of the platform. But the entire shot layout, and if you walk around the arcade, I'd encourage you to do it, walk upstairs and start looking around at more of the modern machines, somewhere from around 1990 and on. Pretty much all of the machines you'll see, all of the new interesting features are in the upper third of the playfield. And it sounds wrong. You're probably shaking your head if you're not doing it ex <laughs> outside, you're, you're doing it inside your head. But walk around upstairs and you'll see that all the, all the major ramps, all the major targets, all the pop bumpers, all those things are almost always in the upper third of the machine. So by making that a module, we're creating the ability to recreate any of those existing machines, almost, and anything else we can do all in the same platform. Because really, how many sets of flippers do you need in your house? How many, how many cabinets do you need? How many back boxes and legs do you need in your house? You're probably the only one playing the machines anyway, so you really only need one set, maybe a couple. But chances are, if you're buying a machine for your home, you don't need an arcade setup. And yeah, some of you are probably like, well, that's what I like about pinball. I like filling my house up with pinball machines. And that's, that's true for some of us. But the majority of consumers, and if we want pinball to reach a broader consumer market, then we need to address these problems because they're not going to buy 10 machines and fill up their house with them. But they might buy one machine that they can change up. It doesn't get stale and it grows as technology changes. The other interesting point about this is once we get these machines out in the market, people start buying them, anybody can design play fields for them. We're open sourcing the interface. We're open sourcing the software, of course, like we did on all of our software. We're also open specking the interface to that upper play field module. So customers, people who buy the machine, if you've ever wanted to build your own custom machine, well now you only have to build your own custom upper module. We've taken care of the cabinet for you, we've dealt with the flippers, we, we have everything in place, you just need to design an upper module. And we'll teach you how to use our boards on that module to integrate into our control system and we make it very easy for you. So customers can build new modules for it, we can go get experienced pinball designers. There are a lot of designers that, that freelance or that, that don't have jobs right now. We could, we could go ask them to design new playfields for us. In fact, our first, one of our first two playfields was designed by Dennis Nordman for the exact reason. He, uh, he had some time, we needed someone to design us a playfield and, uh, and he designed our first one for us. Now it might make sense once we get machines out to go talk to a bunch of the other designers and ask them if they want to do a playfield for us. But we don't even have to ask them. They could go off and do it their own. So other pinball manufacturers could design playfields for our system. They could sell them, they could, we could test them for them, we could, we could license the technology to them or whatever. And uh, I mean, they can make money using our platform. Well, we're looking to sell platforms. And then we're looking to sell games on top of that. It's, it's just like the Nintendo model, right? The PlayStation model, all the video game console models. They come out with this console. And then other third party companies develop games for them. EA Sports and, and all the other companies. They develop games for those modules. The same exact model here. Technology, we talked about it. It's the same boards that we, we're, we're selling as, as individual boards for control system development for people that want to build machines. We're using the same technology ourselves. Everything we put in the P3, every single board that's going into the machine will be available for sale for people who want to build their own machine. You could if you really wanted to. You could, you could recreate the entire P3 platform using our stuff. We teach you how to do it. Again, everything's open source. And I know a lot of companies come out and say, oh, we're going to open source everything. Open source is the keyword. People, people are keying in on that phrase because it sounds like it gives them the freedom to change the code or to make the game play like they want it to play. We're saying the same thing. We're going to open source our game code. All of our unlicensed games, everything that we come up and we create, we imagine up and create code for, we're going to open source. And why should you believe me any differently than, than we may or may not believe any of the other companies? Because everything we've done so far is open source. Our PROC, our PROC schematic is online, our, uh, our low-level drivers are open source, you can go download them today, you can go download our game frameworks, you can go, like I said, check out all the code we've written, some of our customers have written. All the stuff that we do 
bless you, that doesn't have proprietary stuff in it, we've open sourced. And like I said before, open platform is related to the, the hardware interface. So we want the system to be open platform. We want anybody to be able to design modules for us, for the machine, and write game code for the machine. And we make it as easy as we possibly can to allow that. Another key word that's being thrown around a lot in the industry lately is network connectivity. And yeah, it just makes sense that people are talking about it now because pretty much every electronic consumer device you buy is network connected. Your phones, your computers, your heck, even some new refrigerators and, and microwaves are connected to the network. Um, we're technology people. I used to work for, for a networking company. It's just part of the product. I, I, don't, I, I don't vision a pinball machine that doesn't have network connectivity anymore. You need to be connected to a network to download code updates, to, to get new game software, to, uh, s to track statistics, your high scores. All that should go to a database. You should be able to connect to tournament servers to do multiplayer, multi-machine games. One of the first two games we're going to discuss in a minute is a racing game, kind of similar to racing games you can play on video game consoles, though it's a physical incantation of those. But it's network connected, so you can literally play your game against, or you will be able to, against people in different areas. Someone else has a machine across the world, you can play against them. So network connectivity isn't just for maintenance, it's also for interactive gameplay. Serviceability. That problem with people maintaining their machines at home. We're trying to address that as best we can. This is a picture of our flipper assembly and it's listed under top mounted assemblies. So our machine, because it has an LCD monitor in the play field, it causes a problem. The first two prototypes, when we drilled through that monitor to mount flippers through them, the, the monitor stopped working. <laughs> um, so, so the question is, why do we do it twice? Um, <laughs> So we had to come up with a way to, do, to, to implement our flippers, to implement our slingshots without requiring them to go through and mount through the play field. So we developed, and I wish I had one with me. I flew in from Texas, we didn't drive, so I unfortunately didn't bring anything physical besides the boards to show you. But this is a, a basically a piece of plastic, clear plastic, from which the flippers and the slingshots are mounted from below. So they're hanging from the ceiling of plastic, transparent plastic, it looks in the picture like it's opaque. That's just a, an artifact of the coloring on the picture. But it's a clear plastic thing that the flippers hang down from. Some of you all have played the machine. You know what I'm talking about. They're, they're real flippers, real physical flippers, real ball, real slingshots, real actions. You see the coils mounted there below. That's where the apron will be. So you won't see the coils on a release system. You'll have a, a, a traditional pinball apron there. But it's floating. It's a top-mounted assembly where all the devices are floating from above. So for instance, if a flipper breaks, or if, if you want to take your flippers off the machine to clean your play field or to, to, to repair something, you just literally, on this model that I'm showing now, it's got six screw holes on the outer edges of the thing. You pull up six screws, there's one cable harness that connects the, the thing to the system, and that's it. You lift up the flippers, your entire play field's exposed to you. You just wipe it down, you clean it, you stick the flippers back on, reconnect them, you're good to go. All of our assemblies, we're, we're trying to address in the same way. We, uh, it, we implemented the machine with our, um, with our, I screwed up the slides when I changed one this morning, with, uh, with our um, driver boards. So there's a picture of the underside of our machine. And what you don't see is just wires spewed going everywhere. We have our boards. Well, one, because we have the big monitor, we don't have a lot of stuff going on in the center of the play field. Like our, our, pop, our, uh, our slingshots and our flippers aren't wired from underneath. They're wired from over the top. And that's why there's one, one harness going up to the top of the, the play field, going up to the front. And that connects to the flipper assembly. But everything else is, um, is, is similarly module. So we have those, uh, those wall and scoop targets that you saw in the center of the play field. There are actually 12 coils in there. Each one of those coils is, is dual wound. So there's 24 coil circuits in there. This picture has them in there wired up and working. And you just don't see the wires. There are a few wires you can see, but you can't see many. If you look real closely, you can see the driver boards mounted below the uh, scoops in the back and above the walls in the front. You're looking at them along the plane, so they're hard to see. But the wires literally go right from those boards to the devices they're controlling. So short wiring runs are easy to debug. Each board has an LED near the fuse that it's, uh, that's controlling the power, so figuring out what's wrong with a, 
with a board is broke, with a board is easy, and like we said before, if one of these boards happens to go out and you need to replace it, you don't have to disconnect your own whole your whole game. You just pull you just pull one of these connections out, pull the board, stick a new board in there, and you're good to go. So we believe. I mean, I don't know if it's true or not. We I, this is the cleanest machine I've ever seen, as far as wiring goes. It's also one of the more feature-rich machines I've seen, and you still don't see a lot of wires. The the ribbon cables you see, the ones coming out of the the P rock that's mounted right below the monitor, those are actually for our ball tracking technology. So those ribbon cables will be there, but they don't drive coils and, and switches and stuff. Those are specifically for our ball tracking. So now let's talk cost. You'll notice in blue are the exact same shapes that the video game example was earlier. And yeah, they're a little higher now because now we're talking about physical pinball instead of virtual video games. But now I've adjusted the, uh, the red, which is traditional games, to an average point. I, I think I've put $7,000 on this, on this slide. So traditional pinball machines, like we said, are somewhere between five dollars and $10,000. Some of the, the higher end models are going for 8, 8K and, or 7,500, 8K, and some of the, the, the baseline models are going for 5K. Our machine's expensive too. It's expensive to re-engineer a lot of stuff. We have our new flippers, we have a new cabinet, we have, we've re-engineered the whole machine, so the machine itself is expensive and there's, there's no way we can get around that. But because you only need to buy the machine once, you make up that money when you, play the, when you buy the games. So adding a game module to our machine, so it'll ship with, I, sh I should say, because it's important that the entry number two is blank because you get the second game for free. Our P3 will ship with two games. Ships with the one Dennis designed, and it ships with that racing game I talked about, which I'll, I'll address in a minute or two. But so you pay, we're, we're right about the 9500 price point right now. We're, gonna, we're hoping to retail it at 10K. For that 10K, you get two games. So average those out, you're paying $5,000 per game for your first two games, which is already cheaper than the competition. If the competition games cost $7,000 a piece, you buy two of them, you spend $14,000. With us, you buy a machine, it comes with two games, it costs you $10,000, so $5,000 a game. And then after that, all you're doing is dropping new playfield modules into the game. So as long as we can create interesting new playing styles and new playing features and new game themes and new artwork on these modules and new interesting things that, that are very similar to new games from the other guys, then our pricing model is, it, it blows everybody away because our new games are, are $1,000, $1,200 maybe. Well, of course, it depends on the features we put into a game. We may have one that's $2,000 and one that's $700. It just depends on the features. But the point is that new games for our machine, because you're not rebuying a cabinet, you're not buying a new set of flippers and legs and back box, our games can be significantly less expensive. And as we talked about, it, they take a lot less floor space because they're just little modules now instead of a full machine and everything else. So we really did try to apply that video game console model to physical pinball. I think this is a summary, advanced, improved serviceability, one spot in the house, and less expensive games. Availability, we're taking pre-orders now. Um, we expect to ship it, we're hoping to ship the machines, we were hoping early to mid next year. We're still looking for some help uh, financially, we're looking for investor help. We currently have three full-time employees, I think I said at the beginning, and a bunch of part-time em employees. So we're committed to developing the machine. If we get full investment in the very near future, we believe we'll have the machine shippable early to mid next year. If we don't get investment help in the near future, we're not stopping. We're going to continue developing the machine, but clearly with, with part-time labor and people helping us nights and weekends, it'll just take longer to do it. But we're committed to developing the machine, we're committed to releasing it, and we're uh, excited about it. So we're taking pre-orders now. You can order them here. I have some forms with me. You can order them online. We're hoping to hit production in, in Q1, but of course that depends on us getting fully funded here very shortly. This says P3, where are we now? And the reason it's backwards is because we're developing our machine almost exactly opposite from everybody else in the industry. Everybody else starts with the theme. They say, hey, there's this, this movie, I want to develop a game about this movie, or this, this whatever, this sport, or this band, or this whatever. They develop, they announce that theme, 
people know what they're getting. They know they're getting a traditional machine based around this theme. It's going to have neat features. It's going to have artwork that's relevant to that theme. It's going to have features relevant to that theme. And I know what it is, so I, I'm excited about it. Our machine's totally different. Right? Our machine f effectively is unthemed. It's a platform. It's like buying a Nintendo. It's a, the, the old Nintendo Wii was just a white box that you stick on your entertainment center and it doesn't have any colors. It doesn't have any anything. It's just a, it's a box. You then add games to it. So the thing about our system is it's all new technology. So we had to develop it. We had to prove it. We had to uh, get feedback on it. So the last year or so, we've taken our prototype machines to shows. We've had it at the Texas show at Pacific Pinball Expo last year. We've had it at um, a bunch of different shows, getting feedback on it, making sure our technology worked, making sure people were excited about our, our vision, our, 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 our system, our, our interactive artwork our modular play field, our walls and scoops, making sure people liked all that stuff. It doesn't make sense to go spend money creating artwork for a machine that people don't like, that doesn't play well, that isn't interesting. So we had to get that feedback. And now we have that feedback. Now we're developing games for it. The feedback was obviously positive enough that we're moving forward. So we're developing our two games for it now. And we're going to move forward from there. And I guess that's all I got on the P3. So let's have questions about the P3. Can you please walk up to the microphone? Thank you. Uh, you spoke of networking, and that makes sense. Is your networking any different than your sound? Doesn't your networking come from your host PC? Does your P3 board have networking in it? And, and why, since you're, why would you treat that any different than you're treating sound? OK, so how is sound, how is networking different than sound? It's not. You're right. The computer drives both sound. But what you're asking, or what you're suggesting is, um, why am I talking about networking as if it's a cool feature because it's already on the computer? The same thing about sound, yeah. But the computer has the, the networking, so it just makes sense to integrate that technology so into I, the it, gameplay. That's fine. It's just a philosophical thing. I mean, I agree that these boxes should be connected. It opens up. Connected computing is way different than standalone. And that's probably the biggest thing that's changed in the last 15 years. And connecting these boxes will change their use as well. I agree. I just was trying to clarify if there was some special magic net network hardware on the P3. OK, so the important point isn't actually the hardware. The important point is the software. So yeah, you have software. I mean, you have hardware on the machine that does networking and that does sound. To use that sound hardware, well, pretty much any program, you just click play on something and it plays. To use the networking hardware, most of the common programming languages and, and frameworks, programming frameworks, have networking functions built into them that you can use. But you have to then make use of it. How are you going to use that networking? Are you going to do stats tracking with them or connect your games and have, have multi-game gameplay? And that's the stuff we're committing to develop. Oh, that'll be part of your open source stuff that's that will right. be available. That's right, yes. Thank you. It's a race for the microphone. So you talk about the uh, the modular, uh, the modules in the back. Um, I mean, I love your scoops and your walls from the demo videos that I've seen. But uh, how much of that is going to be in each module, and how much of it actually gets taken out? So the the question is, I guess, related to how much of the machine is really modular. The, the LCD and the walls and scoops are all part of the platform. Everything behind the scoops is a module. That's, it's a, it's a 20, almost 22 inches wide by 18 or 20 inches deep. It might, be, it might be a little more. It might be 22 inches deep. Anyway, it's basically a 2 by 2 area on the machine that's swappable. And again, I, I'd encourage you to go around, the, go around the room upstairs and see that that area is pretty much where things change on the existing machines. But yeah, so every game will ship with, the machine will ship with the LCD, the ramps, I'm sorry, the, uh, the scoops and the walls, the flippers, you know, the cabinet, the legs, all that stuff. And then just that upper play field will be swappable. And what's interesting is how designers will make use of those walls and scoops. Because we have example games where you just open a scoop, you shoot into it, then another one opens up, you shoot into it. That's one example of how they can be used. Um, those scoops, just like any other game that has scoops, can be static. You can have one that's open all the time, so every time you shoot it, the ball goes down. You can have walls that come up to block shots. You can have all the walls come up except one to open up shots. You can do all kinds of different things with the scoops. And it actually doesn't even restrict the uh, ability to put playfield features 
where those scoops are. I mean, think of games, uh, Dracula is a good example, where there's a ramp that, that raises up and you can shoot underneath the ramp. So theoretically, you could design a ramp from your play field that, that comes all the way down over top of the walls and scoops. And when the walls and scoops come up, the ramp just, just lifts up too. Um, but even beyond that, we've talked about ways, we floated the flippers, we floated the side targets on the machine. We can design a play field that has things extended off from it. Think about the crane in, a, in the Batman game, The Dark Knight. There's a crane that extends all the way to the front of the machine and it, it goes back and forth. We could build that into one of our upper play fields, have, a, have some kind of thing that extends up over top of the monitor and just moves back and forth. We can, we can have floating pop bumpers, we can, we can do all kinds of things. We just have to engineer them differently. It's all about engineering and, and imagination. We can probably recreate, we can recreate scoops over top of the, we've talked about this, we've designed a scoop assembly that floats over the monitor. Nothing touches the monitor, our ball tracking still works, but you can literally have a physical mechanism over top of the LCD that the ball can go into, you can hold on to it, and then you can release it later. It doesn't, it doesn't touch the screen, it just floats above it. So, yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, I'm a home collector, but I prefer the traditional look of a, a back box with the head on it. Mm -hmm. You haven't had that at your shows and stuff like that, and you've talked about it today. It, it, for this game, uh, does it come uh, or is the head optional? Good question. The head, the head there's going to be a number of options on the machine. One, I, sh I should address that because we're developing a consumer model product. You can go buy an iPhone and then you can put different skins on it or you, you, you have choices with your furniture. You can buy any kind of style of furniture you want. You can buy a pool table and have it be some nice carved wood or you can buy a commercial quality um, old Housen or Brunswick table that's pretty well, it looks commercial. It's not, it's not a furniture style. So we're offering a lot of options with our machine. One of those options is a back box versus just a low profile speaker box. The back box, if you choose your machine with a back box, it will look like, a, look like that picture. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Just to put it on the screen as we're talking about it. So the back box, it looks like a traditional back box. It's got the speaker cutouts, it's got a front panel, and it's got a translate. And it actually says on that translate, it's a little bit uh, low res. It says themed translates go here. So every game we release will probably ship or have the option for you to, uh, to take a, a translate that's specifically drawn for that game. So if you decide to change up your game and leave it there for a week or two weeks or three weeks, you can have that translate representing your game. Same thing with the side art, by the way. We're offering different wood style cabinets. We're also going to offer a way to put replaceable side art on the machine. We've, we've figured it all out. We just, we just haven't announced how we're doing it yet. But you'll be, you'll be able to get different side art for your games. So again, change your translate. You can also change your side art. It's literally going to be a peel and stick. and it's Very easy to come off, very easy to replace. You don't like our side art, anybody can go develop their own side art and just stick it on there. You're no longer having to commit your... Yep, we just got to change the battery. And Okay, so yeah, the side art's an option too. So um, legs, those, those traditional um, industrial looking legs, we, we won't be having those legs. We're gonna do custom legs as well. And conceivably, either we can offer or other people can develop their own. I mean, people like modding their pinball machines. So they like putting toys on their games. They'll probably develop new things for the upper play fields. They'll probably, after we release games and show people how easy it is to replace our side art, They'll probably, there will probably be different side art options for each and every game we do. People will probably develop new legs for our machine because we'll make it easy to connect those as well. So yeah, lots of options with the machine and the back box is certainly one of them. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Uh, just a couple of questions. Sure. Um, how many balls can you simultaneously track with your ball tracking system? Good question. So the existing tracking technology is as good as it ever needs to be. 
<laughs> and by that I mean we can accurately track the three or four balls before all of the incoming data just before they overlap each other. So if you're tracking three or four balls on a multi-ball, do you really need to? So you're playing multi-ball and, and you're usually looking at the flippers, trying to keep all the balls in play when you're playing. And these balls are all running around the play field. If, if, we, if we malfunction, if we see an interaction where one didn't actually happen, you'll probably never even notice. So at, at some point you have so many balls on the play field that it really doesn't even need to track well. But we can track three to four balls accurately. Are you limited to only two flippers with your system? Good question. Also, so no. I mean, we have a floating assembly. So you could change out that floating assembly. You could have four flippers at the lower play field. I think you're probably asking, though, can you put flippers in your upper play fields? Yeah, sure. Upper play fields are like maybe I want to have a flipper in you know, mid play field so that I can have a side shot. Right. So the way we've developed our flippers, and it, it's patented technology. We have a cable-driven setup to drive our, our, our flipper bats. You can theoretically put flippers wherever you want. Somebody could certainly develop a, a play field with a, a flipper on the side and that's driven from a cable that's routed underneath. It's, it's certainly possible. Or, I mean, if you're developing a play field, I guess you could put a standard flipper underneath the play field. It's a, it's a traditional style piece of wood or whatever. So certainly nothing about our system restricts people from doing whatever they want on the upper play fields. And I should have mentioned that the, the targets on the side, just beyond the, you can't really see them in the picture, but there are side modules above the flippers but below the walls and scoops. And our current side modules have blocks that are LED lit that are actually switches, so it's kind of like side targets, but LED lit side targets. We're going to make those easily swappable as well. So any new game that comes out can have a new play field and new side modules. And if somebody wants to put a flipper in the side modules, they can do that too. So nothing about the system should be restrictive, except for the fact that you can't drill a hole through that monitor. <laughs> Everything else is pretty much fair game. Um, final is just more of a comment on your cost of ownership slide that you showed. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's realistic to say that each new machine costs 7 k because it ignores the fact that oftentimes I can trade my machine and have no money out of pocket for another pinball machine and continue my hobby at a single purchase for many years. And whereas in this uh, design system here, I'm going to be collecting a whole bunch of different parts that I now am storing, but I can't really, you know, trade off for other things. But uh, just a comment more than anything. True. No, no, I don't, I don't disagree with that specific example, but a lot of people are buying five or ten games and stick them in their house, and those people aren't selling one game off. If you're just buying one machine and you want a second one, you sell off the first one and get a second one, then of course, yeah, you, you're only out of pocket whatever it is you spent for the machine counting into the equation, how much you were able to get for that machine when you sold it, and, and how the cost model works out. But yeah, true. If you, if you want to fill your, your house up with 10 machines, then you're paying that whatever for each game. Are we doing Kickstarter? Are we doing Kickstarter? We have talked about doing Kickstarter. Kickstarter is great for small priced items, for, for a video game that costs $30, for, for some kind of artwork, for something that you can go develop and give people back almost the full product for a little bit of money. Probably we're not going to go get a thousand people to commit ten thousand dollars or a thousand dollars to our cause and, and, and if they do what do we give them back? So Kickstarter is great for certain products. We don't believe it's great for these these high priced things but I could be wrong. Yes please Eli. Um, going from the driver board to the full system obviously it becomes a choice between using our own computer and OS whatever we want to something that you guys have built into the platform and I'm just curious if that has been decided at this point or it's... So uh, let me rephrase your question you can tell me if I understood it correctly. We're going to put a computer in our system we're going to ship it with that computer what is that computer and will it have enough power or functionality to extend to things you might want to put in your game later. Exactly. Okay. So, no, we haven't spec that computer. We're still kind of discussing features for our software framework. We have a good idea what it needs to be. What we need to figure out is how good it needs to be in three or four years. Um, with that said, if somebody, us or a third party, or somebody comes out with a game in three or four years, or even today that's just, that needs crazy processing power, 
you don't necessarily need to use our machine. You could swap out the machine, or at some point when we as a company get to the point where we need more power, we'll just spec in a new machine and say, in order to buy this game, you're also going to need to swap out your machine. Um, again, we're talking machine. We talk about computer because it's easy to say that the computer is a machine, but what we're really talking about is some kind of processing engine. And yeah, we'll probably, well, we'll definitely go with some off-the-shelf Intel or AMD motherboard, but um, yeah, the specifics of it we haven't figured out yet. Certainly, it needs to be capable of doing real-time uh, graphics manipulations at probably 1080p. So it won't be some weak atom board. It'll be, it'll be a real computer. Go ahead. Sorry, one more thing. Sure. How, how much uh, mean time before failure and stress testing, et cetera, have you performed on this? And will your devices meet all of the standard you know, FCC, UL listings, et cetera, that are required? Uh, for most products, commercial products. So how much testing have we done and how much official certification things are we going to go through? So right now our machines are prototype. We've started doing million cycle tests on all of our major mechanics. Our flipper assembly is going through million test cycles. We won't ship it if it fails after a, a hundred, a hundred flips or whatever. We're making sure that, that those mechanics are reliable for UL and CE and everything else, if we want to ship machines out of the country or even in the country, we have to get certain certifications. So, yeah, we've developed products our whole life for, for other industries. Pinball is a different beast, but it has very similar certification processes. They're expensive processes, unfortunately, but we have to do them in order to ship, so, so we will be. It's not a requirement that we're unaware of. Anybody else? Well, I thank you all for coming. Feel free to talk to me now or after. And I'll be in the, uh, the game room all weekend, so feel free to find me there. <laughs> <laughs>